the Eastern Bloc countries tried to do was to make marriage about love. Like, I'm with my partner because we have a lot of things in common, not because he pays my rent. And that's why I think that women have better sex under socialism. Studio Solidaire at Manifiesta with Kristen Gatsi and Iman Ben Matkur. Hello, Kristen. Thanks for being here today. Kristen Gatsi is an American professor in Russian and Eastern European studies. Her knowledge of socialism and feminism led to the book we will discuss today, Why Women Have Better Sex Under Socialism. So the title of your book intrigues. Uh, it's the least we can say. What was the inspiration for the title and for the book? I want to know, why have women better sex under socialism? Actually, um, it, there was a really wonderful documentary film called Do Communists Have Better Sex? It, that was the name of it in English. And it referred to a, a series of studies that were done between East and West German women, both before 1989 when the Berlin Wall fell, and then they were replicated after 89, so in 90 and 91. And what they found was when they asked women to talk about their sexual satisfaction. And they asked them several different questions. Did your last sexual encounter leave you satisfied? Were you happy the last time you had sex? But any way they asked the question, they consistently found that East German women said yes more often than West German women. And a lot of people were really surprised at this finding. And so then the question was, as a social scientist, this is such a perfect, um, what we call a natural experiment, because you have two populations, the same culturally, divided for 40 years only by their economic and political system. And so when you have this really consistent finding that shows that women in one side of this uh, divide are saying that they have better sex, the natural explanation is it's something about the economic and political system that allowed for women to have greater self-satisfaction in their per personal lives and private lives. Why? <laughs> What were those economical, right. um, socio-economical so, factors? So there are, you know, there are a couple of explanations. Obviously, yeah. um, you can talk about the role of the church, right? So Western Germany was much more conservative in terms of religious life than Eastern Germany was because of greater influence of atheism. But really the thing that I talk a lot about, and that's why the subtitle of the book is And Other Arguments for Economic yes. Independence, is that the East German government, unlike the West German government after the Second World War, where in West Germany women went home and were expected to stay you know, in the kitchen with the children or maybe go out only to church, right? But in Eastern Germany, women were given jobs and women were educated and women were mobilized into the labor force. And the, the East German government really, through magazines and various forms of education, really tried to argue that men and women should be equal. And they allowed women a certain amount of economic independence that gave them the kind of confidence so that they were no longer dependent on men. And, and that's really the core of the, of the argument. In societies where you have expanded social safety nets with, which support women in their dual roles as mothers and workers, women have more confidence and more ability to leave unhappy, abusive, or otherwise unsatisfactory relationships. So is it true that in the old so socialist experiments, great strides were made in women's rights and gender equality. It's an unknown story, certainly in the Western countries. In Belgium, we don't know how women's rights were put into place. Can you tell us something more about that, please? Yeah, so I actually think this is a really important history for people on the left to know. And, you know, the the imbrication between women's rights and workers' rights and socialist ideas really goes back to the 19th century with women like Flora Tristan, who was a French-Peruvian utopian socialist living and writing in Paris. People like August Bebel and Clara Zetkin, obviously Friedrich Engels, were all writing about the relationship between the economy and women's rights. And what happens really is that in 1917, uh, prior to the, the 1917 revolution in Russia, you have women like Alexandra Kolontai or Nadezhda Krupskaya or Inessa Arman. These are all Russian 
Bolshevik women who are very committed to, in the worker state that they hope to build, to incorporate women's rights. And so in the, between 1917 and 1936, when Stalin shuts everything down, you have incredible experimentation with a radical expansion of social safety nets to socialize women's domestic labor. So you have obviously things like kindergartens and creches, but you also have public cafeterias and ca canteens. You have public laundries. You have mending cooperatives, right? So there's this idea that if you socialize the labor that women do in the home, it's much more efficient. It gets done more, um, you know, uh, quickly and efficiently, and it frees up women to actually pursue and have lives outside, not only of the domestic sphere with their partners and children, but more broadly, it really starts to, to expand the definition of what it means to be a woman, right? Not just a mother or a wife. Okay. But they also had the right to abort and the right to vote also. Absolutely. So, so uh, women in the Soviet Union, or actually women in Russia, between the February and the October Revolution get the right to vote. Also, Alexandra Kolontai became the first commissar of social welfare, and she was in a position of great power to implement many of these reforms. Can you just explain who Alexandra Kolontai is? So Alexandra Kolontai is a really interesting figure. She was herself a theorist of the relationship between women's rights and capitalism and socialism. She was actually an aristocrat uh, who started out as a social democrat. She was a Menshevik, and she remained a Menshevik until 1914. And in 1914, after the um, Social Democratic Party of Germany votes war credits to the Kaiser, uh, she becomes a Bolshevik and she ends up siding with Lenin. And uh, Lenin makes her the first commissar of social welfare in 1917. So she was a very, very influential figure. And she, um, she was the one, together with some of her colleagues in this Russian organization called the Women's Section, the Genotel, they were the ones responsible for putting into place all of these policies. Now, as I said, including the first country in the world to give women the right to abortion on demand in 1920. Um, women had the right to divorce, women had all sorts of freedoms, including the right to reproductive freedom. It's all reversed in 1936. But after Stalin's death, it comes back. And especially in Eastern Europe, in countries like Poland and Czechoslovakia and East Germany, Bulgaria, you have an incredible expansion of women's rights. Now, it's not universal. Places like Romania and Albania were not very good places to be a woman, especially in Romania after 1966. But there was much progress that was being made in this part of the world that we really need to study and learn about so that we can kind of apply some of the experience that they had to the challenges that we face in the present day. I'm going to show you a picture <laughs> Ah, Valentina Tereshkova. Yes. yes. So like when women were going into space in the socialist first socialist experiments, women, uh, the Western, her Western sisters were still installing their kitchens. Absolutely. This is 1963. Yeah. yeah. So it's the same year in the United States that Betty Friedan writes this book, The Feminine Mystique, which is believed to have kind of kicked off the women's movement in the United States. But but uh, the uh, launching of, of, of Valentina Tereshkova into space, of course, it starts in 1957 with Sputnik, the launch of, the launch of Sputnik. Um, the American government was very content to let women stay at home with the children in the kitchen, as were many governments in Western Europe, by the way. But what happened in 1957 is that the Americans said, how did the Russians put a satellite into space? How did the Russians put a dog into space? How did the Russians do X, Y, and Z? And what they realized was that uh, in 1957, 13,000 women were graduating in the Soviet Union with degrees in engineering. In the United States, it was less than 100. And so if you think about that, 13,000 women engineers, They had so much more brain power in the Eastern Bloc because they were educating women in science, in technology, in medicine, in all sorts of 
professions that were in the West still very much reserved for men. And so, in 1957, there was a book called Woman Power, where the United States government, the National Manpower Planning Council, basically said, you know what, I think we need to start educating some women. So, they, in 1958, they passed the National Defense Education Act, which set aside money for the education of women in mathematics and science. And then in 1963, when uh, Tereshkova was in space, she was the front cover of the New York Times. Um, Russians orbit, oh, no, Soviet blonde, first woman in space, right? That's how they refer to her as a blonde, right? Because they didn't know what to do with this, you know? And then slowly, I think what starts to happen is, and as I argue in another book, it's this challenge from the Eastern Bloc countries that are really showing that women can be astronauts, women can be mathematicians and engineers and scientists, that suddenly sort of forces the West to kind of say, ooh, maybe we should really do something to educate our women too. Yeah, that leads me to my next question. Did the rapid emancipation of the women in the East have an impact on the feminist struggle in the West or on the consciousness of equal rights between men and women? You know, so I think that there's a there's a kind of two-pronged answer to that. And of course, the, the, the situation that I'm most familiar with is the United States, but I think there are analogies in many countries in Eastern Europe. Uh, sorry, I, I mean in Western Europe. So in the initial period between 45 and let's say 57, I think the emancipation of women in the Eastern Bloc actually prevented the emancipation of women in the West because a lot of men in government said, oh, we, if, you, if you let women outside of the kitchen, you're a communist, right? Women, any woman who was um, in the public sphere, who was speaking, she was a communist. And we had McCarthyism in the United States, and many, many women were persecuted as, com I mean, many women, they were communists, right? They, were, they went to the fight in the Spanish Civil War in the 30s. Many black Americans were communists, right? So there was a, a huge pressure. Anybody who um, was in favor of civil rights, of the equality between black and white people, anyone who was in favor of women's rights, you were communist, and that was bad. After 1957, after the beginning of the 60s, as I said, because of this realization that it might be useful to have women in the labor force, suddenly the West tries to catch up with the East. And I think there's a, there's a rapid, and you especially see this in the discussions about women in what we call the Global South, right? Which is the better path to economic development? And many women, in Africa, Asia, and Latin America, we saw it with the Cuban Revolution, we saw it in places like Vietnam, they were very much attracted to these leftist parties because they promised women's emancipation. And I think that that's a, that challenge to the kind of capitalist model of development really accelerates the attention to women's rights, and, and especially at the United Nations. It's the communist countries who are the first ones to propose that 1975 should be International Women's Year. And because they propose it, there are these three big international United Nations conferences in 1975 in Mexico City, in 1980 in Copenhagen, and in 1985 in Nairobi. And it's at those conferences that most of the global women's rights frameworks that we have today, they were established from those conferences and they were directly as a result of superpower competition between the West and the East. Okay, and did the fall of socialism had an impact on women's rights also, not only in the West, but also in the East? Absolutely. Again, um, we look for natural, as a social scientist, we look for natural experiments. If you want to see the effects of capitalism on women's lives, the best natural experiment that you can do is to look at what happened to women in Eastern Europe after 1989 and women in the former Soviet world after 1991. And what we have seen, almost without exception, is that the status of women has declined precipitously. And I can go into many, many, many examples of that. In the West, the last World Conference on Women was held in 1995 in Beijing. and. The reason there hasn't been another one 
is because people are afraid that we'll actually roll back women's rights at the international level. There has not been another big world conference on women since 1995. So, and what you see all across, not just the Eastern Bloc countries, but the United States, is this resurgence of very conservative gender politics, so that there's this fantasy that life would be better if women just went back into the home and took care of the children and, and you know, you know the story. So yeah, I think there's no doubt in my mind that the fall of the Berlin Wall and the fall of the Soviet Union really kind of stole the thunder of a lot of international women's organizing. Okay. But it certainly wasn't perfect under socialism. There was still a painful patriarchal culture, like everywhere in the world. Were there efforts to address this? Was there any perspective to do something about this? Oh yeah, so, so first of all, I definitely want to acknowledge that it was not perfect, right? Uh, patriarchy persisted as it does everywhere. There were great efforts that were made, I think, to, to try to change men's point of view. And uh, I have many colleagues in Poland, in Czechoslovakia, in East Germany, my own work in Bulgaria, that shows all of the very creative ways that these state women's committees tried to get men to help out around the house. So here's a, just a, a short, like very concrete example, which I think is really funny. So in Bulgaria, I, as, as in many places, women cook in the kitchen, but when it comes to making barbecue, men cook outside, really? right? You know, when you grill. Is it true That's, here too, right? Yeah, right. yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so the women's committee said, okay, men will cook if it involves like something that they think is masculine. So, so we have to figure out how we can make certain domestic tasks more manly. And in Bulgaria, when you drink rakia, which is like the local spirit, yeah. um, you eat it with meze, which is like a salad, right? And so the women's committee tried to convince men in Bulgaria that women, you know, for meze, they don't chop the vegetables the right way. Like you have to use a big knife and you have to chop them in a specific way for it to be right for rakia. And the thing is, is that it worked. When men suddenly realize, oh yes, vegetable chopping is manly because it involves a big knife or something like that, it, it was a, it was an attempt to do um, an attempt to kind of regender domestic tasks. In the end, the truth is that it it didn't work, and so almost every single one of these women's committees decided that the more progressive way to deal with this is rather than keeping this labor in the home was to socialize it to make more public cafeterias in Poland they had milk bars like little na neighborhood restaurants where you could get very cheap Polish food which helped women immensely every school had cafeterias for the children every factory had places where women could go after work and get food to take home either pre-prepared or the ingredients for a meal right so there were lots of ways of trying to address patriarchy, but by no means were they able to eradicate it. What is the connection between more rights and facilities and the personal relationship between women and men? Does that mean more divorces? More divorces. Yeah, it does. Unfortunately, I think that when, um, you know, look, when Alexandra Kolontai, one of the first things that she did in 19, one of the first decrees in 1917 was to take marriage away from the Russian Orthodox Church and to make it a secular institution which allowed for divorces. And what happened? <laughs> Suddenly everybody got, women were like, I can get rid of this alcoholic guy, thank you very much. It was a way that the Bolsheviks got a lot of support from women by allowing them to leave um, they're mostly alcoholic, sometimes abusive husbands. Now, that wasn't necessarily a good thing in the long run because then it turned out that when a woman got pregnant, the men would also run away, right? Okay. So, but yes, I mean, in one of the things that you see in East Germany, the East Germans were, in fact, quite proud of their divorce rate because they sh because not only did they have a, a high divorce rate, but they had a very high marriage rate. So that people would like leave one relationship but immediately start another one. And that was seen as progress, right? People weren't stuck for economic reasons in their relationships. Look, 
in my country. So it was not only the divorce rights, it was also for economic reasons. Yeah, absolutely. In my country, because we do not have national health care, 25% of women under the age of, of 65, when, when we have national health care, under 65, 25% of women get their access to medical care through their husbands. So if you divorce, you can't see a doctor. That's how it is in my country. So many women, not only for economic reasons, right, but for the basic access to something that should be a human right, they have to stay in a marriage. Many people in my country, as well, get married for health care. So I have a, a couple friends of mine who have been together for 20 years, and they're journalists, they're freelance writers, and finally, one of them got a job at a university, and in order for her to get health care, they had to get married. That was the only way she could actually see a doctor. So, so you have to understand that in the West, marriage is an economic institution. It always has been. This is what Babel was writing about. This is what Engels was writing about. This is what Kolontai was writing about. Everybody has been talking about this for a long time. This is not just in the Eastern Bloc. And what the Eastern Bloc countries tried to do was to make marriage about love and about mutual attraction, and about affection, and about similarity. Like, I'm with my partner because we have a lot of things in common, not because he pays my rent, or he's buying me or my children food. And that's why I think that women have better sex under socialism. Today, women's rights all over the world are under attack. <laughs> Poland is uh, attacking the right to abortion. In Texas, also, heartbeat bill prohibits women from having abortions six weeks into pregnancy. What do you think about that? Look, here's, uh, I could, again, this is a topic that I could speak on for a very long time, and I'm trying to be succinct. You so can. <laughs> the thing is that when right-wing governments come into power, or when right-wing forces wish to achieve power or consolidate power the last thing that they want to do is talk about the economic system so what do they do they blame foreigners they blame minorities and they blame women it's always been that way it will always be that way what do greg abbott victor orban and kaczynski have in common they're all far-right leaders and they can know you, can you explain more about those people So, yeah, Spending sorry, uh, yeah. Uh, Greg Abbott is the governor of Texas, Viktor Orban is the pri premier in Hungary, and Kaczynski is the leader of the Law and Justice Party in Poland. All of these uh, are right-wing men who are trying to roll back women's rights. And they also are also very nervous about the declining birth rate among true Poles and true Hungarians, and in the case of Texas, white people, right? Uh, because that's what the American white supremacists are worried about. And so, of course, attacking women's rights and attacking women's right to control her own body is part of a right-wing strategy to appeal to a very conservative base. And I think that we're going to see more of this. We're going to see we're going to see it everywhere that you have more right-wing leaders coming into power. There's going to be more xenophobia, more racism, and more misogyny. It's just it's just the way that fascists work, I think. So, for the first time in history of the United States, there is a female vice president, Kamala Harris. But while women are now in power, women's rights equality between women and men is under severe pressure. So what measures do you think are necessary to achieve that equality? Right, so the first thing we have to make a distinction between liberal feminism, which is this sort of hashtag girl boss, Hillary Clinton, Kamala Harris, um, Sheryl Sandberg, lean in, let's you know get the woman to be CEO or woman to be president and then not care about anybody else. As long as there are a couple of women who are really rich and powerful, then that's fine. We've achieved what we need to achieve. I think the key thing about socialist feminism, again, this goes back to people like Flora Tristan writing in 1843 in the Workers' Union when she it was advocating this uh, Workers' Union in France. She said, women and workers, women and men together need to unite against the capitalist class, against the bourgeoisie, right? The idea is that you cannot have a society where a f like you have a rainbow 1%, right? 
you have a, a couple of black people, a couple of foreigners, a couple of women, and as long as everybody who is super rich is a nice rainbow, then it's okay that 99% of the population is disenfranchised. That's never going to be a good program for social change. So the most important thing that we have to do is create solidarity among this quote unquote 99% to address the fundamental structural socioeconomic problems in our societies. And is that then the reason that you wrote this book? Or what was the reason that you wrote this book? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think the reason I wrote the book was because I hated President Trump at the time. And I felt like I had to do something. I was an academic. I had been writing academic books for, for you know, many years, uh, writing about the experience of women in Eastern Europe. But I realized after writing this op-ed in the New York Times that very few people knew about this research. So that was the first thing, was to make my uh, research relevant to contemporary debates about the role of socialism and feminism. But the other thing that I think is really important is, look, in my country, I assume in many West European countries and around the world, people on the left are often accused of being a Stalinist. They're often accused of being com you know, some kind of communist dictators, authoritarian, totalitarian. There are all sorts of words that get used to describe us. And the way that that argument is made is by saying, well, look at those horrible countries in Eastern Europe. Socialism was tried. It failed. It was terrible. We're never going to do that again. And the point of this book is to say, yeah, okay, those experiments failed. Their economies didn't work very well. They had lots of internal pro uh, programs that failed and they had a lot of problems. Consumer shortages, travel restrictions, obviously the secret police. But there were many things about those societies that were good, like women's rights, like the emphasis on education, like the emphasis on social equality, like all sorts of cultural programs, sport. I can give you lots of examples. My specific expertise is women's rights. Even in West Germany today, the western part of Germany, where they're very anti-communist, mainstream publications will begrudgingly admit that, okay, yeah, well, the East Germans did a lot of good things for women, right? So I think that one of the things that we have to do as we think about how to craft kind of a socialist future for the 21st century is to go back and look at these experiments from the past, get rid of all the bad things, but try to find all of the good things that we can salvage and rethink those good things so that we can you know, move forward knowing the history, knowing the possibilities of the future, and together build a more just, equitable, and sustainable world. Okay. Thank you so much for being here today. Thanks so much interview. for having me. It was really a pleasure. Yeah. Studio Solidaire.